How do you listen to a sermon? Now that sort of maybe sounds like a strange question. How, not do you, but how do you listen to a sermon? Now to help you understand more fully what I'm talking about and why I'm asking the question, let me ask this question. Can you remember the last time that you heard a sermon and because of what you heard in that sermon from God's holy word, you changed the way you're living? Can you remember that? Let me ask you a couple of other questions. If you hear something in a sermon with which you agree, is your reaction to that sermon different from the sermon in which you hear something with which you do not agree. You know what I'm talking about, of course. Because sometimes the preacher will get up and he'll preach something and it has to do with something that God has taught, which I've understood and I've obeyed and, and I'm, sitting, I'm sitting there listening and I think, that's good, we need this, this is God's word. And I'm very encouraged by hearing it proclaimed. But then if the same preacher comes along and he preaches something that, you know our phrase for it, steps on my toes a little bit, then sometimes the thought will be, well, why is he preaching that? I think he's preached that before. I've heard that before. He's aiming that right at me. In other words, do you listen differently to the sermon with which you agree from the way you listen to one that has something with which you disagree? The point is that God in His Holy Word has taught us that this matter of preaching and listening to preaching is serious. When I was a student at Fried Hardeman, way back in 1900, and let's talk about something else. <laughs> but when I was a student at Fried Hardeman, and I was a Bible major, I had already started doing some preaching, and I knew what I was going to do with my life. I intended to preach the gospel, and I, as I just said a few minutes ago, have been doing it by the grace of God and by the blessing of God for almost 60 years. I took a lot of classes at Frieda Hardeman about preaching, how to prepare and deliver sermons. I took classes about public speaking and the better way to use your voice. Of course, when you get through listening to me, you are probably thinking, I bet you skipped a bunch of classes, didn't you? You needed to maybe take another course in it. I don't know how you'll perceive it. But let me tell you this, that in addition to taking all those classes at Frieda Hardeman way back years ago, I still buy books having to do with preaching. I read books. I just finished reading one just a few months ago, one of the best that I've read in years on the glory of preaching, which had to do with the significance of it and the importance of it. 
Well, one of the chapters in that particular book was a chapter that pointed out how the process of effective preaching is a two-way street. The preacher should prepare himself the best he can, deliver it the most effectively that he can, realizing, remembering that he will answer to God for what he says and the manner or the attitude in which he says it. I will answer to God for what I taught here in the previous hour during Bible class. I will answer to God for what I'm going to say to you in this hour. That's how serious this is. That's why James said in James 3, Brethren, be not many masters. And to put it down into maybe our language today, it means don't, ever, don't all of you run out to become a preacher or a teacher because, he said, you're going to have to answer to God for what you teach and preach. It's serious. But you see in that book, the pointing of that two-way street, that's the preacher's responsibility, but the two-way street comes back, and that is the audience has a responsibility. Be careful how you listen, because you are going to answer to God for how you respond to that which you are taught. You are going to answer to God for your reaction to that which God has revealed in His Word. And when a man like myself, who is a minister of Jesus Christ, stands before you and tells you what the Bible teaches, he's going to answer to God for that, but you're going to answer to God for what you do with what you hear. And that's what I want to talk to you about. Here's the lesson plan. We're going to look at our Bibles at three scriptures. And what we will see in these three scriptures are examples of the way that people can receive the truth. And then when we're through looking at those three, we will close our study, conclude it, by coming back to the scripture that was read for us earlier from James chapter 1. Uh, yes, James chapter 1. Now turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 to start with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Acts chapter 2. When you read this chapter, of course, as a student of the Bible, you understand that this is a record of the day when the Lord's church was begun, on the day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apostles were given the baptism of the Holy Spirit that enabled them to speak in all of the languages that the people there spoke in, those that were gathered in Jerusalem for that great festive day. They proclaimed the gospel. The sermons of all of those apostles is not found in here. But the sermon that Peter preached on that occasion is found in this chapter. And to economize our time, we just skiply, simply skip down to verse 36, where Peter is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaiming the good news about Jesus. So in verse 36, Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. That would be what I would call as a public speaker, that, uh, that would be what I would call as a gospel preacher, his climactic point. He's already talked about the prophecies about Jesus. He's talked about some things in Psalms. He's talked about some things in Joel. He's told them that what you've been reading in the Scriptures has now been fulfilled. And he said, I want all of you to know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus that was prophesied Lord and Christ. 
but he inserted a little statement there that pricked their hearts. You killed him. He told them specifically what they had done was kill the one whom God had prophesied that he would send to be the Messiah, the Savior of all men. So look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter answered and said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Are you thinking about how they reacted? In the context of our study, he told them they were wrong. It pricked their hearts. We would call it convicted. It convicted them in their hearts. And they said, what shall we do? And he told them what they should do. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that you shouted in anger a few weeks ago when you wanted him crucified. You now repent and be baptized in that very name, that same name, in order to have your sins forgiven. Look at verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I submit to you that that is a marvelous example of the right way to listen to the truth being proclaimed. It's a great example also of how the truth ought to be proclaimed. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't leave them wandering or doubting. He told them, here's what happened, and you're guilty of sin. But because of their attitude, they very submissively said, tell us what to do. And those that received that word with the right attitude did what they were told. Now turn over to chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And this is the chapter in which we have a sermon that was preached by one who was not an apostle, but a great gospel preacher by the name of Stephen. Stephen. And I want you, again, just to economize our time to come on way down below the end of, or to the end of the chapter to verse 50, 51, where Stephen looked at his audience and he said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Now pause in your reading and let's, let's sort of bring that up to 2016. What Peter, or rather what Stephen is saying is, you all are stubborn, your hearts are evil, you're not listening to the truth. So he says, you stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. Do you see what he told them? He told them the same thing that Peter told his audience. And surely one of the most convicting parts of his message was, he said, can you name even one of the prophets that your mothers and fathers did not persecute? Well, what were those prophets talking about? 
They were talking about the coming of the just one, Jesus Christ, the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah. And your fathers persecuted every one of them, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. Let's see how they reacted. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. They killed the preacher. Why? Because they didn't want to hear what he had to say. Why? Because what he had to say convicted them and made them feel wrong. Let's compare the two. In the first one, when Peter was preaching, he told them they were wrong. In the second one, when Stephen was preaching, he told them they were wrong. Peter said to his audience, you kill the Son of God. Stephen to his audience said, you killed the Son of God, the one that the prophets said would come. Peter's audience said, we're wrong. What do we do about it? Stephen's audience basically said, how dare you talk to us like that? We will not listen to that. And with a mob mentality, they stoned him to death. On the first hand, a marvelous example of how to listen. But in this case, with Stephen, an example of how not to listen. Let's look at one more. Look at chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, maybe even at that same opening, there's the story of the man that we know as the Ethiopian eunuch, a religious man in search of truth. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship. He was on his way back to his home, riding in a chariot, reading from the scriptures, precisely the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, which is, as you probably remember, a scripture that prophesied about Jesus Christ. God, through an angel, guided a minister of the gospel by the name of Philip to that chariot. He guided him there so that he could tell the truth to that man. Let's see what happened in that particular case, beginning at verse 35. After he had joined him in the chariot, and the eunuch said, who's he talking about? In verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, un, and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chair to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. That story illustrates, first of all, the right message. The preacher has the responsibility to preach the gospel. 
tell the truth. People are living in sin and are therefore under the condemnation of God. And they need to know that God loved them, that Jesus loved them enough to die for them just as we celebrated and remembered in the eating of the Lord's Supper. He preached Jesus to them. But the eunuch illustrated the right response. First of all, and I didn't take time to read all the story, but prior to the time that Philip began to preach Jesus to him, Philip illustrated the right attitude. He was sitting there reading scriptures. This man of God joined him in the chariot. And the eunuch said, who's he talking about? Is he talking about himself? or some other prophet. You see, Philip had already asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how, how can I unless some man guides me? He knew he needed to be taught. He knew there were things he didn't understand, and so he asked questions, and he said, tell me who he's talking about. The right attitude, the right response. And then when Philip preached to him about Jesus, from his heart as they were riding along he looked and saw a body of water and he said right there's some water what's keeping me from being baptized what a good attitude Philip told him if you believe with all your heart you may and he said I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God stopped that chariot they both got out of the chariot they went down into the water Philip baptized him and when he came up out of that water, he was rejoicing, going on his way rejoicing. Marvelous example of how to listen. Three stories. All three involved the preaching of the truth. All three involved telling the hearer that he was wrong, that he needed to do something. In the first and the third story, the reaction, the response was, tell me what to do and I'll do it. But in the second story, there was defiance. There was rejection. There was stubbornness. Isn't it intriguing that in that second one that tells about Stephen preaching to that audience, he told them they were stubborn people and they just turned around and illustrated it. He told them, said, your minds are closed. You won't receive the truth. And they proved him right. So now I come back to my first questions. How do you listen? What's your attitude? If you're hearing the truth and you've already obeyed it it's easy to accept that isn't it but if you're hearing the truth that makes you realize that you're not living like you should that challenges you our last scripture turn to James chapter 1 that was read for us earlier in James chapter 1, the brother of our Lord addressed this very matter. Verse 21, he said, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. How much you hear is not the crucial matter. How much you know is not really the crucial matter. 
The important thing to consider is what are you doing with what you know? It reminds me of the story of the old farmer. He was out working in his field one day and he saw this young man coming toward him. And he had a little case of a sort that he knew was something was in there. So he walked toward the young man and he said, may I help you? And the young man said, well, said yes, that you're a farmer, right? And he said, yes, I'm a farmer. He said, well, I have a book here I want to sell you. He said, what's it about? He said, well, it's 1,001 ways to be a better farmer. And the farmer said, I'm not interested. He said, you're not interested, why? He said, I already know more about farming than I'm doing. Could that be the way it is with some of us as Christians? That we already know more than we're doing. So what are you doing with what you know? What are you doing with what you hear? How do you hear? Do you hear with a desire to learn? And then if it convicts you, how do you react? Think about it. Jesus said, Not everyone that heareth these words of mine, but he that doeth them is the one that's going to heaven. That's what he taught in Matthew 7. It's that story of the wise man and the foolish man. They both hear, they both listen. But he said, the man that just listens and doesn't do anything about it's a foolish person. It's the man who hears and does what he hears. That's the wise man. Think about it. Open your songbooks, please, if you're going to use a songbook. Brother Joe has announced a song that we're going to sing to invite and encourage those who are not Christians. And as we sing this song, if you're not a Christian, and you're ready to become one, we'll be glad to assist you. If you're an erring Christian and you need to come back to God and confess your unfaithfulness, we're ready to assist you. Come while we stand and while we sing. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven.